Let's read it together, shall we? Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering, the sacrifice of God, or a broken spirit. And a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with a sacrifice of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. And may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word today. The verses I would like to stress to you this morning, uh, verse number 6 and verse 10. Verse 6 again, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, inside. That's what God's most concerned about. Not so much the outside. I know the, the outside and what we do, the actions of our life is important. And, uh, but many times, we can do the right things. We can have the right actions. But there can be something wrong with the inside. The inside doesn't match with the outside. Like it may appear. God desires truth in the inward parts. God desires us to be honest, totally, completely honest with Him. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. This is where God works on the inside. Okay? We must not get too caught up in the outward appearance and you know what we look like as a Christian on the outside, or what people think of us as a Christian, but be more concerned about the inside. The outside will naturally be what it needs to be when the inside is right. We should not be worried so much about making sure the outside, our actions are right without first dealing with God on the inside. Does that make any sense to you? <clears throat> I'm saying that you can pray, you can read your Bible, you can witness, you can give out tracts, um, you can sing, be faithful to church, all these things, and the inside is still not where it needs to be with God. We can go through these motions as a Christian, and it appears, it looks like we're doing okay, we're doing all the right things, but inside there could be a problem there. Okay. David was here getting to the root of things with his sin, right? With God. He was being honest before God. He was no longer going to try and hide it or put it off. or He was going to deal with it. Right? When he was confronted by the prophet Nathan. Nathan says, Thou art the man. Sometimes God says to us from His Word or through the preaching of God's Word, Thou art the man. You're, you're the one. You've got this problem that you need to deal with on the inside with me. You need to be honest. 
God desires truth in the inward parts. David said, Lord, create in me, verse 10, clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. We need to be in tune with Him. Amen. All how important it is to be in tune. Just like a, a stringed instrument, from time to time, they have to be tuned. From time to time, we need tuning. We can't just let ourselves go. From time to time, there needs to be evaluation. We need to be reevaluated. Right? And we can think that we're in tune sometimes when we're not in tune. Because we've gotten used to being out of tune. <clears throat> That's right. Our heart can deceive us. And it can say to us, oh, you're in tune. But you're not in tune. It can lie to us. It's a very deceitful thing. So we must come to God and be honest with Him and allow Him to work in our hearts. And He is the one. Notice David says, create in me a clean heart. God is the one that makes a clean heart. Not you. He's the one that does that. He's the one that does the tuning. Yes. He's the one that renews a right spirit within you. This is not something that, at the snap of a finger that you can make happen on your own. It takes a work of God. And it has so much to do with our sincerity and honesty before Him. Wonderful passage. Thank God for this passage being in the Bible. Amen. It's, it's precious to me. So precious. Go with me now to Jeremiah chapter 3. Uh, the message today has to do with being wholehearted before God. Serving, living for God with our whole heart. With my whole heart. Jeremiah has a lot to say about the heart. The will of man. Deep down the inside. Where all those official decisions are made. Where the spirit, soul, and body meet. Jeremiah has much to say about the heart of man. Jeremiah chapter 3 Verse number one, the Bible says, They say if a man put away his wife and she go from him, become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Isn't God forgiving? Isn't he so forgiving? Lift up thine eyes into the high place and see where thou hast not been lean with in the ways of Thou hast sat for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withholden, no but the blessings of God in our life. Sometimes we, we miss out. I know God, He's good to us, okay? But there are special spiritual blessings that God gives to those that are truly honest with Him and desire to live for Him with their whole heart. There's a special closeness that they can have, that we can have with God. Therefore the showers, verse 3, have been withholden. Uh, there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead. Thou refusest to be ashamed. Will thou not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone upon every mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. And I said after that she done all these things, Turn thou unto me, but she returned not. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Okay, so we're talking about here the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Now remember Israel, the northern kingdom went into exile or they were conquered by the Assyrians and then Judah was left. Alright? And J 
Judah saw what God did to the northern kingdom. Sometimes we see how God deals with others about their sin. We see how God chastises others, what they've gone through. This is all to give us a warning. How many warnings does God give us in the Bible? So many warnings, warning after warning after warning. Your treacherous sister saw it, God says. Verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Uh, harlot here, God speaking of going and playing around with idols, worshiping other gods. And we can do the same. Yes. Verse 9, It came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with stocks. Stocks, they're speaking of, of trees and groves and different things they would use to worship idols. Verse 10, And yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart. Now notice this, but faintly, saith the Lord. The word faintly there means to pretend. It means to be hypocritical. She would appear that she had turned unto God with her whole heart, but God says, no, you're just pretending. You're just playing a game. You don't intend to serve me with your whole heart. A lot of God's people are like this. A lot of Christians are like this. A lot of them are like it and don't even realize they're in that state. Because they've gotten so used to being out of tune, they think they're in tune. They've convinced themselves that they're serving God with their whole heart, but meanwhile it's just with their half heart. They're serving God wholly with their half heart. And they they're convinced themselves and told themselves and been deceived by their heart and thinking it's their whole heart when it's not. God says, Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but faintly. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. He goes on to say, Verse uh, 13, Only acknowledge thy iniquity that thou hast transgressed the Lord thy God. And verse 14, Turn, O backsliding children, for I am married unto you, he says. God wants to forgive us. He wants to restore us. He wants to help us. He wants to bring us to this realization of truth and honesty in our hearts before Him. To understand the deception that we can be in. Even as God's people. These are God's people he's speaking to here. Now Jeremiah, he was sent to the house of Judah, the southern kingdom. At the very end, or close to the end. Uh, when God finally brought his wrath and his judgment against them. Through the Babylonians. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? Prophet Jeremiah was sent by God to, to warn them and to tell them, hey, listen, you're acting the same, calls them treacherous sister, Judah. You're acting the same as Israel did before God. You're doing the same thing. And yet God reaches out in love. He, he says in verse 15, I, I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Verse 17, at that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of, of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to the name of the Lord to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after their imagination of their evil heart. God looking for the day when he could bless them again. God wants to do that. God wants so much to help us. And is looking forward to that time when we will return. Like in verse 22, return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. Now go over to chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4. 
Verse number three. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. It's time to stir things up. Right? Time to reevaluate your life. Stop sowing wrong. Doing some wrong sowing. Sowing among thorns. God that's not good. You need to stop that. Verse 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Lest my fury come forth like fire and burn, that no, none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. A cutting away of the flesh. We, we see in the book of Galatians, it's very clear, the Apostle Paul talks about how when you're saved, uh, you've got two sides to yourself now. You've got the spirit, which is now the real you. You're a new man. You're a new person in Christ. And the spirit of God dwells within you. At the same time, you're still in this body of flesh. It talks about the spirit and the flesh. If you walk in the spirit, not just live in the spirit, you're saved. But if you walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, Paul says, right? Here God is speaking about that cutting away, taking away of the flesh more and more and allowing the Spirit of God to have more control in your life. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 20. Jeremiah 5, verse 20. Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding. Now what does this verse remind you? What's, what's another passage this verse will remind you of? Which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. This reminds me of Revelation chapter 3 verse 17 where it talks about the Laodicean church. That uh, last of the seven churches that the Apostle John speaks of there. This would represent this time period that we are in of the church age, the Laodicean age. There the Lord talks about how you're naked, you're wretched, you're blind, right? This this church, the, the overall picture of, of God's people in this time. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for a bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? Though the waves are of toss themselves, yet can they not prevail? Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. Verse 23, But this people hath a revolting and rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart, Let us now fear the Lord our God, that giveth rain, both the former and the latter, in His season, and reserveth unto us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Verse 25, Your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholden good things from you. God says there's certain areas in your life where I, I want to bless you and use you but could not. Your sins have withholden my hand of blessing. Go to chapter 7 now, verse 24. Jeremiah has much to say about the heart, does he not? Jeremiah 7, verse 24. But they hearken not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. We don't believe in losing your salvation. We do believe that it is possible to backslide. This is Bible. The Bible does speak of that. Right? They went backward and not forward. You know, we're, we're either going one or the other. Right. We're either going forward with God or we're going backward. We need to go forward. Amen? That's right. Chapter 9, look at verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 40. Look at it. There's some verses here. And the great prophet concerning our hearts. Jeremiah 9, verse 14 says, But have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, a false god, which their fathers taught them, 
root word of imagination is image. Image is anything that would take the place of God in your mind, in your heart. They walked after the imagination of their own heart. Look at chapter number 11, verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 8. Yet they obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but walked every one of the imagination of their evil heart. Look at chapter 13, verse 10. Chapter 13, verse 10. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart, and walk after other gods to serve them, and to worship them, shall be even as this girdle which is good for nothing. Look at Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 12. And ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. And then chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1. It says, the sin of Judah. Remember the treacherous sister? God called her. Judah. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart. Now think about what God is saying here. Okay? He's saying when you sin, when we sin, it is graven onto our heart. A diamond. Is it not one of the hardest minerals in the world? It can cut pretty much anything. Right? When we sin, think of the damage we're doing to our heart. Think of, think of the grooves spiritually that you're making in your heart. Bad grooves. Grooves then where we get in a rut yeah. and it's hard to get out of. That's why we continue to fall in, in certain areas. or it's, it's hard to get past certain things. Yeah. It's because sin makes a deep groove in your heart. Like the point of a diamond. Okay? And then it's very hard to get out of that. You get stuck in that rut that's been made by sin. It is graven upon the table of their heart and upon the horns of your altars, whilst their children remember their altars and their groves by the green trees upon the high hills. You say, Pastor, we don't do that. We don't have idols under green trees. Yes, but we can have idols in our mind and our heart. Yes, we can. Things that take the place of God, imaginations. Paul talks about that, casting down imaginations. We can rebel against God in our mind. Okay? We can have an idol set up in our mind. O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil, thy high places for a sin throughout all thy borders. And thou even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. Out on our inheritance, we can lose out on our rewards. Not salvation. Not being heirs of God, His children. But our inheritance, yes. Rewards, yes. Heritage. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not for. You have kindled a fire in my anger which shall burn forever. I know this is referring to Israel, but God placed these scriptures in here not just as a history lesson yes. for fact that something did occur many years ago, but for application spiritually. This is what I'm doing this morning. This is, this is when God's Word becomes alive, real to you and to me. It's when you apply it. And don't just read it like a history book. You have kindled a fire in mine anger, which shall burn forever. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, 
in a salt land and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. He should be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth forth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green. What, what uh, passage of Scripture does that remind you of? Psalm 1-3. Amen. And shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Now verse 9. One of the most famous verses in the Bible. If you don't know this verse by memory, memorize this verse, okay? It's a very important verse in the Bible concerning your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. We truly can't know our own heart. That's how deceitful it is. It can be. It can trick us. It can trick us into thinking that we're wholehearted when we're not. It can trick us into thinking that we're in tune with God and the Spirit of God when we're not. Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. God is always willing and wanting to work on our behalf, if we'll but let him, if we'll but allow him to have his way. Second Chronicles, now if you would, go with me over there. Let's look at another passage of Scripture I believe that we can make a spiritual application to. I think it would be a help to us this morning. And it's in Second Chronicles chapter 17. It has to do with one of the kings of Judah, that southern kingdom. Uh, Judah had most of the good kings, you might say, that loved God. Not all of them loved God. Not all of them were good kings. But I would say Judah had more good kings than Israel did. Jehoshaphat was one of those good kings of Judah. Uh, we see there uh, in verse number 3 of uh, chapter 17, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and saw not after Balaam, Jehoshaphat, a good man, good king, loved God. But he sought to the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel, the, the northern kingdom that forsook God. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah, the southern kingdom, brought to Jehoshaphat presents and in riches and honor and abundance. But then I would like you to notice what happens in chapter 18, the very next chapter, verse number 1 says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance which God had given him. But then it says, And joined affinity with Ahab. He joined in an alliance with the northern kingdom, with, with the king Ahab. King Ahab was a wicked man. Did not love God. He had a wicked wife. Remember her name? Jezebel? Oh, wicked woman. Right? Hated God. Hated the men of God. Persecuted the prophets. Right? Wanted to kill Elijah. Remember that? Wanted to kill the man of God. Commit murder. Wicked, wicked kingdom. The, the, the northern kingdom of Israel. Joseph, had, God's man, the one God had anointed to lead his people, the southern kingdom of Judah, joins an alliance with King Ahab. This wicked king. This is a type of us yoking up with our flesh. Coming into an agreement with our flesh. This is where we have a divided heart. When we compromise with our flesh. We give in to our flesh. There are certain areas, certain weaknesses that we have. We know it's wrong. Because we're spiritually alive now. We're, we're living in the, the new man. We've been given the Spirit of God. He tells us. He makes sure we know what's right. Okay, He tells us. His Word and the Spirit of God. Our two parents, right? And yet, we join affinity with Ahab. And we make concessions with the enemy. I'm telling you, your biggest enemy is not the devil. It's not the world. It's you, the flesh. That, that 
the members, the body that you live in. It's not the real you if you're saved, but I'm saying it's part of you. Okay? And it's very real. And it's a very real enemy. It is the enemy. It's it's one of the the main things you deal with your whole spiritual life. Okay, this flesh. The Apostle Paul said, Who shall deliver me from this body of death? That's what he called it. Oh, wretched man that I am. Right? The Apostle Paul admitted the fact that he had to deal with this flesh. And how wicked it could be. Anti-God, anti-Christ. It's like I, we have to live with it. It's, and our heart, where all the decisions are made, the, 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 your will, okay, deep down the inside, that's where everything meets. That's where everything comes together. Okay. And your heart can be so deceptive. So deceptive you, you don't even know what it's telling you is true or not. Okay. It's, it's almost like the heart is it's like it's the middleman between your spirit and your flesh and it, it wants to work out these deals. God's like, no, no, no deals. Stop making deals with your flesh. You're mine now. Okay? And one day you'll have a glorified body, but for now, you need to fight the good fight of faith and you need to walk with me and allow me to have more and more control of your members and your body. And to have all of your heart, all of your will in line with me, under my control. Joseph had made a great error. We do the same. We make concessions with our flesh. We join affinity with wickedness. Ahab was wicked. Look at chapter 19. Second Chronicles, if you're still there, chapter 19, verse 1. Joseph had the king of Judah returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, here a man of God, went out to meet him and said to Joseph, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? What were you doing? How could you do this? Joining affinity with such a wicked king as Ahab. Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, and thou hast taken away the groves out of, thy, out of the land of idol worship and hast uh, prepared thine heart to seek God. So it's a rebuke and um, at the same time it occurs with all, all this all together. Um, now look at chapter 20. Notice verse 3. Some good things about Joseph. He wasn't all bad. Joseph had feared, it says in, in verse 3, and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. They were being attacked by an enemy, by Moab. And Joseph had says, let's seek the Lord. This was very good. Okay. Look at verse number 12. And our, he praised unto the Lord. Uh, that last phrase, but our eyes are upon thee. You know, he looks to God, right, for the victory. Verse 21. He consulted with the people. He appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army uh, to say, praise the Lord for His mercy endureth forever. Uh, music with going out to battle, uh, that, that's an Israelite thing. That's a Jewish thing. It, it wasn't the Scottish or the British that got that. God's people a long time ago. Verse 22, And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, or when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. God fought their battle for them. A great victory, right? Josephat was a good king. And I'm not saying you're all bad here today. Okay, don't, don't get me wrong. Okay? There are good things in you that, that God has put there. He saved you, and you have the Spirit of God that dwells within you. I'm not saying there's no hope. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not trying to discourage you today. All right? I'm just, I'm trying to warn you about your heart. Because I know what God's showing me about my heart. And it's pretty scary. 
So I'm just passing on what God has showed me. All right? Like Jehoshaphat, I know if you're saved here today, there's a part of you that loves God and wants to do what's right. All I'm saying is, don't allow your heart to deceive you into serving God with a half heart, but serving with your whole heart. We see Joseph had, he didn't learn from what the seer had said to him, uh, Jehu, back in chapter 19, and he did it again. After Ahab died in that battle that they were with there in Ramoth Gilead, Ahaziah, Ahab's son, takes over the northern kingdom. And it says in verse 35 of chapter 20, After this did Joseph, king of Judah, join himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who did very wickedly. He joined with his son after his father died. Notice what happened. Um, they made some ships together, and they did this venture to go to um, uh, Tarshish. And they were, uh, I think they were looking for gold and, and, and uh, precious minerals and things like that, working together on this. But verse 37 says, uh, Then Eliezer, the son of uh, Dodava of Mereshah, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Ahazi, the Lord hath broken thy works, and the ships were broken, that they were not able to go to Tarshish. So as long as we remain in this state of half-heartedness before God, making concession to the flesh, we're going to find there's going to be some brokenness in our Christian life. We're going to find that it doesn't seem like I'm getting anywhere fast. It, it seems like I'm always kind of struggling spiritually. I don't find myself getting as close to God and growing in grace like I, I should. I, I'm struggling. I feel like I'm something not right. There's some, there's some brokenness there in my life. This is results of half-heartedness, of joint affinity with Ahab, making concessions with our flesh, not willing to allow God to circumcise our heart and to cut away that flesh in our life so He can be more and more in charge and control of all of us, all of our heart. Now, going to another illustration of Scripture, go to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. Here are the people of Israel. They come into the promised land. This was God's design way back, but they did not go into the land as God uh, desired them to. They turned back. Now Moses has died. Joshua has taken over as the new leader of Israel. And it's time. It's, it's time to go into the land. Is it, is it not time? Yeah. It's not time for you to go into the land of milk and honey. To go into that land of victorious Christian life. Is it not time? When will it be time for you to deny your flesh? When will it be time for you to deny yourself and take up the cross and follow God daily? Follow Christ daily. Hmm? Not just on Sundays. Not, not just when you're feeling good. But all the time. Right? God, you're in charge. I don't dare think a thought. Not even think a thought without you being in control. When will it be time? It was time for them to go in. God says to Joshua, verse 2, go over this Jordan. Go over this Jordan. <laughs> This is just as significant as the Red Sea. Uh, I mean, I, I know salvation is, is totally awesome. Amen? To be saved. And what it must have been to go through the Red Sea. But this has its place of significance. I would say just as much. They went through the Jordan just like the Red Sea. The waters parted. Just like the Red Sea. Did they get saved again? Is that what this is? No, no, no. But they got to a place 
where they were wholehearted. They got to a place in their spiritual life where they were totally submitted. And they said, no more concessions with the flesh. No more. And this is where they began this journey of victory, right? I know they had a few struggles along the way, but most of it was victory. And God did some incredible things. Is God doing incredible things in your life? Is God, do you see God working and doing some wonderful things for you? Or is he just there? And it, your relationship with him is kind of stale. It's just, he's there, he's my God, he saved me. And, but is it rich? Is it full of milk and honey and victory? They were in tune with God. Right. right? They were so in tune they could walk around a city and the walls would come down. Right. When they shouted, there was something about that shout that shook the ground. Because God was on their side. They were in tune with Him. Are we in tune? Can God shake the ground around you? Can God show up in your life and do some amazing things? He can. God encourages Joshua here in chapter 1. Go over this Jordan. Don't remain here. Give me your whole heart, Christian. Go over into the promised land. Don't stay in this wilderness. I've got more for you. Stop looking back towards Egypt. Is that not what they were doing? The Israelites in the wilderness. They kept looking back towards Egypt. Wanting the leeks and onions again. Wanting to go back at times. Right? Concessions with a flesh. This is what this is a picture of. Did they ever go back? No. They never lost their salvation. They never went back to Egypt. Okay? As a country, as, 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 as usual. But they were looking and murmuring and complaining, right, to Moses a lot. Like we do, right, from time to time. No, let's go over this Jordan. It was significant. God parted the waters for them. Just like the Red Sea. This is a type of the transformation that God wants to do in us. To take us to another level. To take us to a level of maturity. So we stop being babies. And grow up. Into Christ. Where he's. In charge. Of not just. The spirit. The inner man. Where his spirit dwells. But all of you. Your heart. Your will. Your body. Your members. Everything. This is God's will. Look at verse number 3. I'm sorry, chapter 3, verse 8. Joshua, chapter 3, verse 8. He said, to bear the ark of the covenant before you. He says, you shall, when you come to the brink of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. The ark of the covenant, speaking of the presence of God. Amen. And when they followed the ark of God and they went into the Jordan, it was dry ground. Um, the waters on, the, on the, the north side of the Jordan stayed like a heap, right? And then all of this was dry. And all the people of Israel went over. Same way God did the Red Sea. Dry ground. A miracle. Amen. And when they all crossed over, the Jordan started to flow again behind them. Alright? And now the Jordan River is behind them. And now there is this natural barrier between them and the past and the wilderness. Just like there was when they were in the wilderness and the natural barrier of the Red Sea. There's no going back to being lost again. There's no going back to Egypt. There's the natural barrier of the Red Sea. God's not going to open it for you to go back and get unsaved again. It's not going to happen. How significant is this? Now they've crossed into, there's this transformation has taken place. They've gone to a new level with God. 
right? And now there's a natural barrier, the Jordan, never to be crossed again by the whole nation of Israel. Now they were in the promised land to stay, to live in the victory, to live in the joy, the bliss of walking with God, with Him, totally in charge, totally in charge, totally in control of their life. It's significant. Yes, they cross. They were all in. They were all in. Are you all in? When they crossed over, they set up memorials so their children would remember what had happened. They set up the stones. Remember that the twelve stones. Verse. I'm sorry. Chapter number five. Uh, verse number two. One of the first things uh, God ordered Joshua to do is to circumcise all those who have not been circumcised. Again, this points back to that passage we read, read earlier in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. Circumcision of the heart, cutting away of the flesh. Right? Allowing the Spirit of God to have more and more control in our life. Great spiritual picture here. This was important for that flesh to be cut away. Chapter 5, verse number 11. It says something else that happened when they went into the promised land. They did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover, and leaven cakes and parched corn the selfsame day. And notice verse 12. And the manna ceased on the morrow. Remember the manna? Remember that stuff that God rained down from heaven? They just pick it off off the ground and eat it. Remember that? It was fresh every morning. The manna ceased when they went to the promised land. And they started to eat of the corn of the land. They started to eat of the fruit of the land of Cana that year, it said. Wow. You know? No more baby food. Right. Wow. No more baby food. Real food now. After you cross the Jordan. To go through the Jordan. Mm. Now there's a natural barrier behind you. No, no, go, no more going back. God, I give you total control. Amen. I want you to have control of every part of me, every nook and cranny. I don't want to leave anything. Nothing. I don't want to think a thought without you being in control. I start eating real food from the ground. Amen. Maturity speaks of spiritual maturity. In verse 13, Jesus shows up in the Old Testament. You say, was Jesus in the Old Testament? Certainly it was, many times. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man that over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Unto him, art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as a captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face of the earth and did worship. And said unto him, What saith my Lord to his servant? Here's something to keep in mind. Angels would not allow you to worship them. An angel of God will never allow you to worship them. This was not an angel. This was God. Amen. Verse 15. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. This speaks of a more holy, dedicated life to God's service. This is where God wants to bring us to. To be more holy. More dedicated. More consecrated. That's right. Your flesh ain't gonna like it. But that's okay. You're not living for the flesh. You're living for God. We're to walk in the Spirit. He deserves all of us. All. A L L. Every part. God goes on, amen, and gives them a great victory there in Jericho. You know the story. 
All right. Let me just give you a few things and we'll close. Jeremiah, back in Jeremiah chapter 24. I got to go quickly here. I'm running out of time. Jeremiah 24. I'll show you just how merciful God is. Notice how Jeremiah puts it. The great prophet. Jeremiah 24 verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs. So will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place to the land of the Chaldeans. Remember the Babylonians that came? Nebuchadnezzar took over Judah. It was God's judgment because of the treacherous sister, Judah, right? For their good. Verse 6, For I will set mine eyes upon them for good. I will bring them again to this land. I will build them, not pull them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. Notice he says, I will give them. This must come from God. Just like God saved you, He also makes you victorious. Joseph had won the battles by the Lord. He's the one that set the ambushments against the enemy. They shall be my people and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. This is God's desire, amen, for all of us. Now, let me give you five things. What needs to happen in order for God to restore us, to make us into this child of God that serves Him with the whole heart? Number one, look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. Real quick, let me just give you a few things here. Five things. Number one, verse 13 says, And you shall seek me and, and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Number one, we need to search for Him. We need to take pains to seek after God. We need to take pains to search after God. Do we casually seek after God? This is our problem. Stop casually seeking after God. Seek after God as if there was hidden treasure in your backyard. There was some massive treasure buried somewhere in your backyard. I guarantee if you knew this, you knew this for a fact, it could be substantiated, you knew it, you'd be renting a backhoe. You'd be doing something, right? And you'd be doing some digging, right? You'd be really getting into it. You'd be all into it. Yeah. <laughs> you'd be really excited, wouldn't you? Yeah. If you had to get a loan from the bank to... Search your whole yard and find you do it because you know that's that's not a big deal when I find the treasure, right? But do we search for God like hidden treasure? Without faith it's impossible to please him. For they that come to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Why are we not being rewarded? Why are we not going over the Jordan? Maybe it's because one of the reasons we're not willing to seek after Him with our whole heart. We're not really willing to put our heart into this thing. That should prove to us right there that we're half-hearted. That should make us realize right there, that should make us wake up and say, you know, the very fact that I don't seek after God like for hidden treasure, that says right there, there could be some issues there with my heart. Maybe I'm not as wholehearted as I thought I was. Right. right? If we're honest, will you be honest today? Will you be honest with God? We need to take pains to seek after God and search for Him with all our heart. Number two, uh, chapter 31, verse 21. Jeremiah 31, verse 21. Says, set thee up way marks and make thee high heaps. Set thine heart toward the highway, even the way which thou wentest. Turn again, O virgin of Israel, turn again these to these thy cities. We need to turn back from the way that we came away from God. This is a picture of talking about the backsliding. Uh, we can think of the prodigal son that left his father's home and uh, went astray into the world. 
We need to turn back to God from our backsliding, from whatever way that we've taken away from God, whatever idols, imaginations, anything that's taken the place of God. We need to turn from these things and turn back to God from the way we came. Go back to Zion. Leave Chaldea, leave Babylon, and go back to Zion out of exile. Return to the Lord. Return into the land of blessing. We need to turn back. It says here an interesting thing. It says to make uh, waymarks. Make waymarks. Make the high heaps. Um, Make markings along the way for others. Amen. Uh, to be an example to others that this is the way to go, to turn back to God. Be a good example. Right. Don't be a bad example. Be a good spiritual example. By the grace of God, we can be if we make the right choices, if we respond the right way to God. I realize God does it in us and through us, but it is our free will to make the choices, though. Yes. Just like when you come to God to be saved, that was your choice, and, and God did all the saving. But there was still that response. Likewise, to grow spiritually, to go over the Jordan, to go into that victorious land of milk and honey with God, victorious Christian life, has to do with a response, a choice that we make. But yes, God, you have every nook and cranny, everything. Right? I want to be wholehearted, God, with you. I will turn again. I will not keep going the way I've been going. I will not stay in this rut. There have been some ruts that have been made in my heart. Yes. Like with the point of a diamond. I will not stay in that. I will realize and see by certain signs that you give me that it looks like, no, I'm not wholehearted. I thought I was, but my heart deceived me. Okay. The flesh, the heart can be tricky things. Very tricky. Just like the devil. Okay. But God, I see now these things and Lord, I'm responding to that. God, I will turn again. Jeremiah, another thing. Jeremiah 31, 33. Number three. Number one, search for Him. Number two, turn again. Number three is in Jeremiah 31, verse 33. It says, But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice he says, after those days. It's going to take a while. We need to be patient. Amen. You'd be patient and let God have His perfect work. Because it might not all happen as quickly as you'd like it to happen. God being in full control. And, um, still, the ruts are there. It's going to take a while to sand those down and for God to do a work to get things back where they need to be. Okay? So be patient with God. After these days, okay? I'll put my law on your hearts and things are going to be much better. But you've got to keep going the right direction though and respond the right way to God. Right. Keep true. yielding. Keep submitting. Yes, God. Lord, you have all of me. Yes, every nook and cranny. All of me. Every, every part. Right? I hold nothing back. I want you, Father, to have my whole heart. I want to live for you, serve you with my whole heart. Be patient, alright? <clears throat> How long did it take the prodigal son to get back home? About as long as it took him to get to where he was. Right? right? It's going to take you about as long to get back as it took you to, to fall away from God or backslide. Right. Be patient, alright? And who knows? God may be even merciful in that. In the time it takes to get back to where you need to be. And then number four, realize, <clears throat> I realize a couple things here. Uh, uh, number four and five. But in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 39. Jeremiah 32, 39. It says, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. For the good of them, for the children, for their children after them. Realize, number four, that God is the giver of one heart. 
He transforms us as we yield to Him. Okay? He's the giver. He's the one that, that makes that one heart within you. It's not something that you can just turn on by yourself. It, it takes a work of God. Just like in salvation. Right. As, as much of a miracle as crossing the Red Sea was and coming out of the world, coming out of Egypt. and uh, It's just as much a miracle as crossing the Jordan and going into this victorious Christian life. This takes a miracle of God. I'm not saying you're getting saved again. Okay, don't, don't get me wrong. Okay, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that. But the Bible does talk about that rest. Yes. The rest for your souls, Christ said, right? Uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Go home and read Hebrews chapter 4 today. It talks about that rest to the people of God. All of these things that happen in the Old Testament, they are typologies of our spiritual life today, right here and now. We can apply them to our life. And this transformation, as you mature in the Lord and, and go to this next level with God, this, this is a miracle. This, this is a work of God. Okay? Realize that. All right? Keep that in mind. And the last thing, let me leave you with this, is also here in uh, Jeremiah chapter 32 in verse number 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my... Just like he said um, in verse 39, I will give them one heart. It's God that does the giving. Notice it's God here in verse 40. I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. It is also, we must understand that God places... His fear in our hearts. I don't know, many times I've, I've thought to myself, God, I've I got to fear you more. I, I, I need to fear you. Right. I, but it is God that places His fear within your heart. He says, I will put my fear mm -hmm. in your heart. This all happens as we respond to God in the right way. That's right. He does this work in us. I tell you, if you want a true gauge of whether or not you're wholehearted before God or not, just ask yourself a simple question. Do I fear God? Do I really, truly fear God? Do I truly reverence the Almighty God? Do I tremble when I think of Him? Do I fear God? If you'll be honest... Yeah. That's a good gauge of whether or not you're wholehearted for God or not. Yeah. How much you fear it. Our whole heart. Amen. God wants our whole heart. He's deserving of our whole heart. He's deserving of my whole heart. Yes, he is. But I must admit to you today, my heart is deceiving. It's so deceptive. Many times I've, have I told myself, you're wholehearted. Most of the time. Right? You're okay. My heart telling me I'm in tune. But I'm not. You know? It's so deceptive. So deceptive. I thought of this, another illustration. Uh, after Germany surrendered on May the 8th, 1945, the Allies partitioned Berlin and Germany into four military occupation zones, if you know anything about, anything about history. The western sectors were controlled by France and the United Kingdom and the United States. They're all divided up over here. They were merged on May the 23rd, 1949 to form the FRG, or the Federal Republic of Germany. On October the 7th, 1949, the Eastern Sector, or the Soviet Zone, became the German, or the JDR, the German Democratic Republic. These were informally known as East and West Germany. I grew up in that era of, of you know, East and West Germany. I always thought that was kind of strange, you know, as a kid, East and West Germany. Why would they do that? Why is it just all one Germany, you know? But it had to do with World War II and what happened. 
the Berlin Wall, Berlin was right smack in the middle of East Germany. Strange, really strange. It had two sides to it. The Berlin Wall, rapidly built in August of 1961, prevented East German citizens from escaping to West Germany, eventually becoming a symbol of the Cold War. Remember the Berlin Wall? You guys remember that? I remember that. You remember President Ronald Reagan's speech? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Remember that famous speech? Before that, uh, John F. Kennedy had made a, a famous speech in uh, Berlin called, uh, I am a Berliner. That was in June 26 of 1963. The fall of the wall in 1989 became a symbol of the fall of communism and German reunification. And just like Germany was divided for so many years, we can re remain divided spiritually for many, many years. Okay? It can happen. And we get, we get used to this. The world got accustomed to this for many years after World War II. Oh, East and West Germany. That's just the way it is now. That's the war. You know? But it wasn't good for the German people. Was it? There was a lot of heartache. There was a lot of pain and suffering because of this. Okay? A lot of these people wanted to be over here. A lot of these people on this side of this city wanted to be over here. So they built a wall. Said, no, you can't do that. Right? They're under communist oppression and rule. Right? Yes, the war was over. World War II was over. The Nazis were gone. Right? We're saved now. The devil's no longer our master. Praise God for that. But we can still be divided. Our heart can still be divided. Even after we're saved. Just like Germany. And we can get used to it. It's just the way it is. God has most of my heart. Most. But God wants all. All. Amen. Will you let Him have all of you? Every bit? He's deserving of all. He delivered you from the Nazis. <laughs> the Nazis of your soul. He's your king now. He's your master. He's your Lord. He's the Almighty. He deserves all of you. He deserves even your thoughts. Everything. Even the thought of foolishness is sin. The Bible says. Is God not deserving? Is He not? No. Yes. Maybe we need to say that to ourselves. Mr. Todd, tear down that wall. Right. Right. <laughs> tear down that wall! Stop making concessions to the flesh. Those Ahabs in your life. Now, let me have all of you. God shall have all of me. Amen. All, all, all. No more flesh. Flesh is a lot like the communist. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh. Totalitarian, right? The flesh is not satisfied with just concessions or a little bit of compromise. It wants to increase more and more and take more of this away from you and God and your relationship with the Lord. It will steal your joy, your peace. This great love that God's done in your heart, Christian. Okay? God shall have all. My whole heart. Be careful of your heart. It can deceive you. It's so deceptive.